Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, we have been talking uh, about going and using this new game that came out that just absolutely took the entire world by storm. I mean, so many hundreds of millions of people who are out there going and you're bumping into them everywhere you turn. People walking around with their phone out in front of them trying to make sure they don't miss some creature that they might be able to catch. And we've talked about how important it is for us as Christians to go. That we are to go, he commands us, over and over again. And he tells us in each of the Gospels and relates that command that we are to go. But what are we to go and do? We're not walking around looking for these little animals that are all over the place trying to catch them all, but he does want us to go out and to tell them all. And the first thing he wants us to do is to go out and teach people how to be saved. We are to relate to them the truth of the Gospel. There's so much false teaching out there about how to get to heaven and what salvation really is. The Bible gives us the answer and the message. He says, go and preach the gospel to every creature. And we took some time to define what the gospel is. Not what I think the gospel is. Not what our church says the gospel is, our denomination or anything else. What what does the Bible say the gospel is? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's what the Gospel is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to pay the price for our sins. Because There's so many people out there, and all religions out there teach you that you have to do something. You have to work. You have to be a good person. You have to be a part of this church. You have to give money. You have to be baptized. They tell you all these things you have to do. But Jesus said, no, there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am absolutely the only way. Trying to be a good person is not amount to a hill of beans as far as salvation is concerned. Because we cannot be good enough. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. That means there are no good people. I've been preaching for close to 20 years now. I'm not a good person. My wife will testify to that. I, <laughs> I tortured her yesterday at uh, one of the sessions. She, she had me post a wonderful picture of her first thing in the morning so the ladies could see. She's talking about getting prepared. And I I held it on there a little longer than maybe what she wanted me to. And and this morning, I thought I'd share with everybody that picture. I'm just kidding. I won't do that. I'm telling you, I'm not a good person. My wife will testify to that. I'm not above showing the picture again. I just didn't prepare it ahead of time. But I'm not a good person. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I'm a good person. The Apostle Paul said, man, I tried to be a good person. From the moment I was born, I was raised in the strictest sense of the law. He said, but the time came where I'd understand that's not good enough. He said, all those things are dumb. Some of you might not like this word. What he's saying is it's crap. That's what he's saying. It's worthless. It's disgusting and vile in God's eyes. Why? Because Jesus Christ paid it all. He didn't pay part of it and then you got to chip in a little bit. No. That's the message to bring. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So that's what we ought to be doing. We go and teach people how to be saved. And every single one of us ought to be 
actively involved in teaching people how to be saved, whether we're knocking on their door and talking to them, whether we're panning out a track at the gas station, whether we're inviting someone out to dinner or coffee or to our home where we can sit down and say, listen, we're friends and I care about you. And I want to share something with you. In taking time to tell them the truth of the gospel, what well, every single one of us, if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, ought to be actively involved in telling others about what Christ has done for them. He says, I want you to go and teach all nations. And the message was the gospel. He says, then I want you to go and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So we, we noted the fact that it doesn't just stop at teaching them the gospel. We ought to continue on. There, it, it, there's more of the work to do. He says, after they come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now notice it says, after. These are in order for a reason. He says, after they come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, then you ought to make sure they get baptized. Turn with me to Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8. The Holy Spirit of God says, Hey, Philip, I want you to go. And uh, it tells us that he ran thither to this Ethiopian eunuch. He preaches unto him Jesus, it tells us in verse number 35 of Acts chapter number 8. Look at what it says. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. That's Isaiah 52 and 53. And preached unto him Jesus. So that lamb that we see in Isaiah 53 says that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the sacrifice for our sins. Preached unto him Jesus. Now notice verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He asked the question. What's, you know, we got water right here. We're traveling along a little bit. There's water right here. What's stopping me from being able to be baptized? Notice the response. Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Believe what? Believe what I've just preached to you about Jesus being the Messiah, being the sacrifice for our sins. If you believe that with all your heart, thou mayest be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, we know that word Christ means Messiah. So he says, I understand. He's the one that would come and pay the price for our sins. Only after he understood and believed it in his heart. See, it's not just about a head knowledge. He believed it in his heart that Jesus Christ was the only way of salvation. And once he believed in his heart, he said, you can, you can be baptized. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, then it tells us when they were come up out of the water. So... It's not just sprinkle a couple of drops on your head. You go down into the water. They came up out of the water. See that with Jesus as well when he's baptized with John. They go into the water, up out of the water. That word means to submerge. That's what the word baptize actually means. We noted that the English word baptize is just a transliteration of a Greek word. That means they take a Greek letter and they match it with an English letter. So that word baptize was not actually a word. They just transliterated it out of the Greek. And what the Greek word means is to submerge. And we noted that it had to do with dyeing cloth originally. They would take one cloth and they would completely dye it another color, and that has to do with changing the identity of that cloth. And that's what baptism is all about. It's not about salvation. Baptism does not save us. Baptism does not wash away sins. It's about identifying with Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. I believe Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, and I am identifying with that message. And I am letting other people know the picture that Jesus Christ died for my sins. He was buried, and he rose again. I'm letting people, I'm identifying with the picture that my old man is dead and buried. That as Romans 6 says, I'm raised to walk in newness of life. The Lord has changed my heart. He's changed my life. And I'm going to live like a Christian now. You see, that's what baptism is. It's not about washing our sins away. It's about letting people know Jesus has already washed my sins away. And so he says, you go teach people how to be saved. And I want to encourage you to help them to publicly identify 
with those who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. Why? Because we need each other. And when, people, when they got baptized in this time period, it was a big deal. It was one thing for you to say, hey, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but when you got baptized, that cut all ties with whatever came before. You were no longer trusting in the law. You were no longer trusting in the rituals and all those things. And, and once they, these early Christians got baptized, their families forsook them. They could lost jobs. They lost family. It was an important decision. But he said, hey, I want you, don't be ashamed of me. You deny me before man, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. He says, hey, if you know Christ as your Savior, you ought not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Identify with me. And so you teach them how to be baptized. And then he continues on. And we'll get where we're going to get here this morning in verse number 20 of Matthew 28. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now that was just our introduction. Now we're going to have a word of prayer and get started. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to study it for ourselves and to freely proclaim what your word says and not fear what may happen to us. And God, at this time, we claim the wonderful promises that have been given to us, that you would lead and guide us into what the truth is. We ask the Spirit of God to do that at this time. If there's somebody here without Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, they've been trusting in good works, they've been trusting in a church or baptism, giving money or something else, I pray that you'd help them to see that that is not good enough. Only by trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ can we have our sins washed away. May they be saved today. Lord, work in our hearts. Speak to each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we talked about the fact, as far as baptism is concerned, that public identification. We noted that just like in, in Pokemon Go, you, you're going to select a team. Once you get so far, you're going to select a certain team. And if you're not an idiot, you pick Team Valor. Otherwise, you pick some other team. I won't make you raise hands and show who you are today. But you're going to publicly identify with a certain team. That's what baptism is all about. It's a public identification. And so another th aspect of this game is you are a trainer. And you're trying to catch these little cartoon creatures. And... Uh, as you accomplish certain tasks and you catch more of these creatures, uh, your trainer level grows. You, you, it, it, it goes up. You start off with one and basically you're, you're nobody. And you get certain level, I think level five, and then you pick what team you want to be on. You publicly identify with them and you continue to grow. And the higher your trainer level is, the bigger and badder and better animal you can catch is the idea behind it. So you don't stay at the level where you're at. You're going to work and do certain things, and you're going to grow in your level. And that's basically what this third aspect is, discipleship. He says, I want you to teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And when we think of discipleship, there's really two aspects to it. You know, we, we are responsible for ourselves. I'm responsible to read the Bible for myself uh, and, and work on my own relationship with the Lord. But at the same time, I'm responsible for those who are around me to help them grow in their walk with the Lord as well. And we're, there, we're to be there to help one another, to encourage each other in the things of the Lord. In fact, God has given us people who are around us to help us in this discipleship process, help us to grow. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. Let's look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now notice the reason that he gives these gifts to the church. Verse 12, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, 
till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And he continues and talks about the body there, but he, he says, listen, I've given you evangelists, pastors, teachers, these other gifts with the purpose of helping you grow in your walk. Now, you wouldn't be a child anymore who's kind of tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and, and all this stuff where he says, you know, children believe a lot of things. They're just naturally, uh, you know, prone to believe somebody who, who's older and who's an adult. That can be a great thing. It can be a scary thing. You know, we might teach our children about the tooth fairy. I hate to break it to you teenagers in here. <laughs> tooth fairy's not real. It's your mom and dad. You know, we, we teach our children the tooth, about the tooth fairy. You know, sometimes we go to great lengths to kind of just have a, a good time with our children, but they believe us. I've got a friend of mine who, who has told their children about land sharks. Sharks that can literally go on land. You've got to be out watching for them. Their children to this day believe in land sharks. Why they're never covered in their science textbooks or anything like that, I'm, I'm not quite sure. You know, Santa Claus, and what are, they're prone to just kind of believe whatever's told to them. Now, that's your business if you want to teach your kids about Santa Claus and whatever else, that's fine, but... Uh, he says we shouldn't be like little children that just believe whatever. In fact, God gave us pastors and teachers and others to help teach us the truth so we wouldn't believe these false things anymore. One of the jobs, in fact, the greatest responsibility and job that I have is to help teach and guide you the truth, to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. He says, for the perfecting. So you wouldn't be a child anymore, but you'd grow up. And sometimes we've known Christ as our Savior, and we've, we've just, we've never grown up. You know, we're like, we're like little children. Look at Hebrews chapter number 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Now tonight in our evening service, we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter number 4. We're going verse by verse through the book of Hebrews at this time. In a few weeks, we'll get to chapter number 5. But Hebrews 5, verse number 12, says this, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, God has given us people that can teach us and help us in our walk with the Lord, but ultimately, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I'm, I've done my job. But I can't force you to listen. I can't force you to put into practice what the Bible says. That's your responsibility. The Bible tells you to study for yourself. Show yourself a, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He, and here Paul's writing to these Hebrew believers, and he says, man, you've known Christ long enough. You ought to be teachers. You ought to be the one who's helping someone else grow in their walk with the Lord. Helping someone else to go from spiritual immaturity to growing up in the faith. He says, but... You've, you've kind of gone backwards. You're still a baby. We've got to go back, and when he talks about the first principles, we've got to go back and teach you the ABCs again. We've got to teach you A says ah, and all of that. My wife is teaching Violet, those sort of things. He says, you're, you're, a, you're a little baby Christian. You have not grown in your walk with the Lord. It says you, you've gone all the way back to reverting. You're not even eating solid food. You've got to have the milk. You've got to have the simple things. When you ought to be a teacher and helping someone else grow in their walk with the Lord, he says, 
Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word, for he is a babe. Notice this, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of a full age. It says, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, somebody who studied the scripture for themselves. Somebody who's taken those things and taught those to someone else. You see, God doesn't want us just to gain information so we can have it for ourselves. The whole point of gaining information, learning about the Lord, learning about His Word, is so that we can give it out to somebody else and help them in their walk with the Lord. It's not to be that it stops at us. Now, the last two weeks of September, we're going to be talking about passing the baton. It shouldn't just stop at us. We ought to pass it on. Give it out to someone else. He says, hey, I want you to teach all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Yes, you ought to be growing on your own. Second Peter, chapter number 1. Notice what he tells us. Verse number 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so he's talking about salvation here, putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 5, And beside this, beside what? Beside salvation. You've come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. He said, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So add to your salvation virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to, and to brotherly kindness charity. He says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us at the end of the book, I want you to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He doesn't want us to stop at salvation. He doesn't want us to stop at baptism. He wants us to continue to add to our faith, to grow and to mature, to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to grow up. Now John 15 tells us how we can do that, by abiding in Him. Just as that branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. No more can we except we abide in Him. And we ought to walk with Him. We ought to talk with Him. We ought to be an everyday part of, of spending time with Him. He says you're to grow up. We've got this kind of double side here. Yes, I'm responsible to work on my own faith and, and build and grow and mature in the things of the Lord. When we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately we're not going to be able to say, you know what, it's my pastor's fault because he didn't teach me. He didn't show me. It's my teacher's fault. They didn't explain it to me. It's my husband, wife, parents' fault. No. He says, you add. You work on your faith. You grow. And so you're responsible to do that. And if you can look at your life and say, you know what, since I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I haven't really grown. I mean, you look at my life and you can't tell the difference between a lost person and me. There's something to matter. You've not grown told the story before about a, a man I know who's a missionary in Mexico for quite some time, and he would go off into these little villages. They're kind of out of the way, off the road. And one day he goes down into this village, and uh, one of the families there says, listen, we want to show you something. And they take him into the little hut there. And here was a little infant as far as body was concerned. It had a little baby's body, and yet it had the head of an adult had some sort of growth problem. There's a lot of Christians like that. They've never grown in their walk with the Lord. Never grown in their faith. We're responsible to study and to learn and to grow for ourselves, but we're also responsible to help others grow in their walk with the Lord. Jesus said, I want you to go and to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's a difficult job. That takes a while. It's not just that somebody accepts Christ as their Savior and somebody's baptized and they're just going to know everything. Sometimes we expect people to walk through these doors like a fully mature Christian, even though they've never been saved or they haven't been saved a while, they've never grown. 
Shame on us if we expect that. It's not an instant process. But we ought to help people. Speaking the truth in love, as we've read in the book of Ephesians. We ought to lovingly encourage people in the things of the Lord. He says, I want you to teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Starting with number one, teach people how to be saved. And we ought to, we ought to, somebody knows Christ is our Savior, part of the discipleship process is teaching them how they can show somebody else how to be saved. See, we're reproducing ourselves in those who are around us. That's what a disciple is. Jesus told those men as he gathered them around him, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. You just follow me, spend time with me, and I'll make you into the fisher of men. He said, you ought to reproduce yourself. Teach them how they can teach others how to be saved. Once we've done that, teach others to encourage others to be baptized. And then we teach others how to teach others all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so basically what you're doing is you're discipling your disciples to become disciplers. You're encouraging them in the things of the Lord. You're teaching them. You're helping them to grow so that they can go out and do the same thing. That is God's plan to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. His plan is not to raise up one person in a congregation. And He's the one who's going to teach everybody. No. He said, I'm going to give you a pastor. I'm going to give you teachers who can teach you who can equip you to do the work of the ministry so that you can go out and you can teach people how to be saved. And you can teach people how, that, to, to encourage them to follow in believers' baptism. So you can teach them all things whatsoever the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us so that then those that you've taught, they can go out and do it. And then they can do it and they can do it. And we can multiply to reach our community for the gospel of Christ. We can multiply, reach our land, and reach our world with the gospel of Christ. But so often, the problem comes when we fall short of doing the complete task that God has given us to do. Sometimes we stop and we don't even go. He said, go, and we won't go. Sometimes we go and we teach people how to be saved, and we just stop right there. We, we end right there, and that's not what he said to do. Sometimes we go a little further than the next guy. You know, we'll, we'll teach them how to be saved and teach them the importance. Hey, you need to follow the Lord. You need to identify with Him in baptism. And we're done there. That's not where it stops. Because if we stop right there, we're not passing the baton. Then it stops right here with this person. But if I teach this person, hey, all things whatsoever the Lord has commanded... You see, then they go and they branch out and they teach others. And they disciple others. We've got to pay attention to the whole command of go. He says, I want you to go and teach people how to be saved. I want you to go and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then he says, I want you to go and make disciples. Teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, I want you to stop for just a moment and I want you to think about who are you discipling right now? Who in your life are you teaching all things whatsoever God has commanded you? If it's nobody, you're being disobedient to His command. He didn't just say, pastors, you go and do these. Yeah. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're just as responsible as I am to go and preach the gospel, to go and teach people to be baptized, to go and teach them all things whatsoever He has commanded us. There's millions of people all over the world that are out there going for a game so they can catch them all. We have something so much greater. They're not even in comparison to go out and do. Are we doing what he's told us to do? I want you to go out and tell them all.